Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we resume our study in looking at the different verses that deal with the 10,000, shall we seek our Heavenly Father's guidance so that we may more properly understand what this symbol means for us and for this time in Earth's history? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for all the blessings that you have been providing and for the new blessings and new mercies that you are providing this day. We ask, Father, as we open your word for your direction and your guidance so that we may more fully understand this symbol and its import for us at this time in Earth's history. As we assemble together, we thank you for being with us, as you have promised. We thank you for your guidance. We thank you for your wisdom as you impart it. We thank you for this opportunity we have to study, to learn, and to grow. Direct us now, be with us each one, so that we may more fully represent your character to all of those around us. For this, we thank you, and for this, we praise you, now and always, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When we left off yesterday, we were dealing with Revelation 5.11. And as we were, as we were speaking, <clears throat> the verse reads, And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders. John is observing angels, beasts, elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 thousand and thousands of thousands so at this point in revelation 5 11 we have at least two doublings in this verse was there anything else that we noted in this verse that may help and add to our understanding of this symbol of the ten thousand Okay, so the one thing we mentioned, of course, is that this uh, we compare this up with Daniel chapter 7, uh, verse, what was it, 21? Okay. Um, Daniel 7. Isn't that what's the verse? It's verse nine on down. Okay, verse nine. Uh, yeah, verse 10, Daniel's. Oh, yeah, 710. That's the one, right? Should have remembered that. Um, yeah, so so we could pair this up here dealing with the judgment that's gonna the judgment is set in the book is open, books are opened. And that's, of course, Daniel 7.10, which lines up with the Day of Atonement. And that's October 22nd, 1844. Um, so, and right now my e-sword's locked up. Funny, so I can't go back. Um, but here, um, so we have this 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. So... Um, there was something else about that. I can't remember what we looked at before. Okay. Part of this with the thousands of thousands has to do with Jude 114, which we talked about early on in this study. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I'd also looked at the Peshitta, so the Aramaic, uh, but I looked and, and I looked at the Aramaic. So the Aramaic is just the Hebrew just translates it into Hebrew words. And right. so you're going to have the Aleph and the Rab. Right. Right. So so you're going to have the, basically the same words that we have in Daniel uh, chapter 10, verse 11. Now, when we're dealing with the Aleph, we're dealing with the first word basically in Hebrew. Right? Yeah, the first, yeah, the first letter of the Hebrew, Hebrew alphabet, which is just an ox head. 
That's the okay. ox. ox means ox. Now, as, as we were addressing and we're looking at this on the thousands and thousands. Yeah. Or thousand thousands. Before us is Revelation 511. We have studied and looked at Jude 114, which has another Greek word in line with this with Revelation 511. But the other verses in the Bible that also address thousand thousands can include Hebrews 12 22. Now, while he, while Theodore's E sword is, is locked up, I got it fixed. You got it fixed. Anyway. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. What do we find in Hebrews 12 22? Um, so, well, that's the innumerable company of angels, but that's the Murias, right? 10,000. Okay. Now, what about Matthew 25, 31? So that's... Um, Twenty-five, thirty-one. Right. Just, I don't have a number there. And his, his glory with all his holy angels with him. It says, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Okay. So it just says all his holy angels. So by inference, we're talking a large number. Yeah. Okay. But in the Hebrew, if we were to look at a couple of these things, if we looked at Deuteronomy 33.2, what do we find? Is, as the, is this verse reads, and he said, the Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. Yeah. These are yes. words of and, Moses. Yeah, so Rababa. Rababa. We're going to be looking at this a little closer because 10,000s is our next portion of this study. Yeah, it's interesting, too. We have the word Kodesh here. I mean, saints, that's um, that's referring to the holy ones, 10,000 of his holy ones. Right. Um, and we have that in uh, Judges chapter 4, verse 10 as well, Kadesh, which is basically the same word just as a city name. Okay. This is Kodesh instead of Kadesh, but it's the same. Okay. So, so, so I think you know, but based on what we've looked at, I mean, you're, we're we're going back to some of these verses, but we can see that. Um, uh, the symbol here does relate to judge it, it gives us more light on judges chapter four right so um and so the last one that i would like us to look at in this in this vein would be mm -hmm. zechariah 14 5. okay how does this interrelate with what we have here? Okay, well, this is an interesting one. So, and ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach 
unto Azal, yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Is that the one you wanted to look at? Oh, and, and the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee. So I guess that's the reason. So again, you're going to have the saints or the Kodesh right. um, coming with him. God. So when all of the saints, again, we have this myriad number, this large number. Mm -hmm. So, but, it's all, but also we have this earthquake. And, and so we talk about the Lisbon earthquake. Right. But have we ever connected it to the earthquake in the days of Uzziah as a symbol? I don't think we have. And if we have, what, what was determined? Well, I don't think we have. I mean, study where we've talked about it and related it to the Lisbon earthquake. So, um, I mean, I want to, like on, on Friday night, I'm going to have to go through this uh, Odilio study as part of our study uh, dealing with 2030 because it relates to it. Um, but, but the basic idea that Odilio had on Sabbath is he looked at the Lisbon earthquake on November 1st, 1755, uh, the dark day on May 19th, 1780, and the falling of the stars on November 13th, 1833. Okay. And he connected those by spans of time to July 18th and showed that they represent the symbols of July 18th. All right. So, um, so that he says that these are tokens. Well, he didn't go into it that way, but Ellen White talks about these as being tokens of the coming judgment, right? And, and of course, these are things, Some two of these are before 1798, and um, uh, one of them is after 1798, but they're, both, they're all pointing to the judgment that's coming in 1844, that's gonna commence. So it would make sense that we have tokens in our time that point to the coming judgment um, in our typical line. So our, our line is typical. Right. Okay. So, so I have parallel to that, to the to the falling of the stars of August eleventh, nineteen eighty, and that's going to be during uh, Glacier View when Desmond Ford is being arrayed, arraigned. How do you say that? And and that's also the date of my conversion, August eleventh, nineteen eighty. So, so that becomes significant in that it's um, the same number of days from my conversion to July eighteenth as the days that the manna fell. So, so there's a symbol there that ties us to July 18th. And then September 11th, I pair up with the dark day, and that's 11,170 days to July 18th, and that 1117 there is a symbol of July 18th. And then we have the, uh, the earthquake in Japan in 2011, and it's March 11th, and March 11th is 311 days before June 22nd, 2011, which Jeff marks. So, so we have all of these uh, these things in our time. But if we're going to go back and we're going to, we could we have a dark day, a falling of the stars, and an earthquake in biblical history? Is there a parallel that we could uh, take? So the, you understand what I'm saying? I do. Now, of course, we have other earthquakes. We have an earthquake, um, you know, when Jesus is being crucified and the veil of the temple is rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Um, but this, this symbol here of this earthquake in the time of Uzziah I mean, that's really referenced in Isaiah, um, and and here you had it referenced in Zechariah as well, right? But so there must be something about that symbol that, and, and we must be able then to be to find a dark day. What would that be, and what would the falling of the stars parallel?
Well, <clears throat> so the question was asked, is it the same Uzziah? Yeah, that's Azariah or Uzziah. In uh, uh, Second Chronicles 26 with the 81. So it's the same person, King Uzziah. All right. So if we if we can establish that there was a massive falling of the stars and a specific dark day to then combine with this earthquake, we would then be able to apply that as being a forerunner to those that occurred during the Millerite times. Yeah, and I'm not saying necessarily a falling of the stars, but something that parallels it in a symbol. Right, okay. And, and you know, so, I mean, the Bible does talk about a cloudy and a dark day, um, which we know is a symbol usually of the Sunday law. Well, okay, now if you're if you're looking at this as a symbol, would the taking of the those with Daniel and the others in 607 yeah be as the falling as the stars mm -hmm. yeah and would the destruction of the temple in 586 be a dark day yeah so something like that whether that's the ones we would we would use or not or if there is there something else that's mentioned in scripture that we just generally pass by okay well, I'm just, you know, when you said as a symbol, that's that's why I was throwing those out. Yeah, yeah. So those those are are, are good ones. But but we do have this earthquake anyway. So uh, it, and it's just that we have it in connection with all the saints coming. Right. All right. So can we, I, um, yeah. Can we fix a date as to this earthquake with Uzziah? That's well. That's a good question. So people have tried. Um, so, um, let me see here. Uh, I gotta find this again. Um, now, one of the things, okay, so in Zechariah chapter 14, it's talking about the coming day of the Lord, right? And and then it's going to reference, where what was the verse we were looking at? Zechariah 14. 14. Um, 1, 4, 5. Yeah. Um, Okay, ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountain shall reach unto Azal, which I'm not sure what that is. Azal, it's a place in Palestine, that's what it says. Uh, yea, ye shall flee, like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come and all his saints with thee. So it's, it's just saying ye shall flee as you did in that day. Right. Now, this, this earthquake um, is referenced in, where is this? Um, where is it, where is it, uh, the other place that it's referred to? Um, I know there's another place. You said it was in Isaiah? Yeah, I thought it was in Isaiah. Um, Isaiah 29.6 is one of them. When it just says earthquake. I don't know which one it's referring to. It could be this one. No. Um, okay, so it's Amos one one, um, not Isaiah. Um, so in Amos one one, it talks about the word of Amos, who was among the herdmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam the son of Joash, the king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. 
Okay. So, um, so one is we know it's dur during the time of Uzziah and Jeroboam, the son of Joash, um, that he has this. And, and so that's two years before the earthquake. So at least we can, one is I, Uzziah has a huge reign, whatever it is, 52 years or something like that. So, um, you know, that doesn't really narrow it down. Uh, too much. But if we look at, um, so Uzziah reigns from, let me see here, um, 810 BC to 758. Uh, but Jeroboam too, he reigns from 823. So it's obviously sometime after 823 BC and before 1758. So it doesn't really narrow it down too much. Um, okay. uh, but I think it would be in the latter part of Uzziah's reign. And, okay. And we also have, um, let me see here. Yeah, so, I mean, we just know that that uh, Isaiah, he begins his prophesying uh, uh, in the time of Uzziah, right? So he, he's going to prophesy through Isaiah, Uzziah, Jotam, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. So he's going to be prophesying then. Um, but I don't think he has a, a direct reference to the earthquake. Um Yeah, so in the king in the year that King Uzziah died, he saw the the Lord on this uh, on the throne sitting on the throne. Um, so I think it's near the end of this time. Um, but even if we don't have an exact year, we have symbols attached to it. Correct. Right. So, um, and Amos referencing it that he prophesies two years before the earthquake. And what are some characteristics of Amos's prophecy? I mean, of the book of Amos. What's his main message? I haven't spent a lot of time studying Amos. Okay. Well, he often says for three transgressions, and for four, and he's referring to Gaza, Tyre, Edom, and so forth. Right. So, so his message is is a message regarding um, the judgments on Judah and Israel, and also um, uh, he, his basically his message is a warning. I mean. Uh, So, so, and he references this earthquake, um, and and if you look at like the last chapter of Amos uh, nine verse one, I saw the Lord standing upon the altar, and He said, "Smite the lintel of the door that the posts may shake, and cut them in the head, all of them, and I will slay the last of them with the sword. He that fleeth of them shall not flee away, and he that escapeth of them shall not be delivered." So definitely, there's symbols here of the Sunday law, the coming judgment. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't, I need to study Amos a bit more uh, to know everything about it. Okay, so the points that we're addressing is that this, beginning with Revelation and the other verses that we were just looking at, are all interrelated and can be applied and pl applied very directly to this coming judgment upon the land that we're calling the Sunday law. 
Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so we have this this earthquake mentioned in Amos and in Zechariah. Right. So it's the same earthquake. So we know that um, it's it's a sign of a warning of something that's going to come. Right. Um, Amos 5, 8, it says, Seek him that maketh the seven stars and Orion, and turneth the shadow of death into the morning, and maketh the day dark with night, that calleth for the waters of the sea, and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. So as we look at this section, and, and I'm I'm gonna step back just a second. Yeah. Zechariah 14, 2. We are applying this as a symbol of what is to come. Yeah. And as this reads, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Mm -hmm. And the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Mm -hmm. Was this a literal fulfillment during the time of Nebuchadnezzar, and will it be a figurative fulfillment at the time sometime close in the future right so that's what we would understand here that this is talking about the sunday law coming okay. but here in this case yeah it would initially be nebuchadnezzar's army coming in and and uh uh destroying jerusalem but it but it also does refer to what happened in 70 a.d as well because that's a type of that well, the alternate reading as well with Zechariah 14, 5. And ye shall flee to the valley of my mountains. Now, the mountains, are they not God's government? Are they not according to God's law? Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it's my mountains because it's Hari, which just is the, the has the yod at the end, which means my. So Har is mountain, my mountains. So, and ye shall flee to the valley of my mountains, for the valley of <clears throat> my mountains shall reach unto Azal. What is Azal? What, how, do, how do we look at that as a figure? Well, I don't know anything about Zal other than, okay, so means reserved. It comes from Atzal. It means to, to separate, to select, refuse, contract, keep, reserve, straighten, take, but properly to join. So to separate and to join, uh, uh, seem kind of be, be opposite things. Well, it's kind of interesting too because Zechariah 14.5 is the of the five verses mm -hmm. that have this word. It's the only one where it is spelled Alpha Z Alpha Lima instead of Alpha Z Echo Lima. Yeah, so in the other ones, it's got uh, a different spelling. Um, it's also a proper name in the others. A, a person's name. Correct. Yeah, instead of a place. But as it continued, yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee. So my mountains, 
being referenced as an alternate reading, but twice, not once. Mm -hmm. So again, we see the import of the first and the second angel's message, but specifically the second angel's message before the earthquake. So could it be that the earthquake is not the ultimate judgment on the land, but the harbinger of this judgment of the Sunday law? Hmm. Could be. Well, I think we have to get go back to to judges to sort of right. uh, look at this. So, with the detail that we're looking at right now, as we had addressed it. We would go back to Judges 4, verse 10, right? Yep. And Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali in Kadesh, and he went up with 10,000 men at his feet, and Deborah went up with him. Now, as we were finishing yesterday, we addressed that we were going to need to be looking at the plural the ten thousands also in relationship to what we're seeing here in judges 410 deuteronomy 33 17 with the primary word the one that moses used reads his glory is like the firstling of his bullock and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. With them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth, and they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. Moses is giving us symbols here. Yeah. He's being very specific about the symbol because everywhere that he presented the 10,000s, he used a singular word. Yet so far we have multiple words that have been used to represent 10,000s in Hebrew, Chaldean, and Greek. Yeah. Now we also have this, these, uh, this is about war. Right, so this is war that is being waged upon the earth by God's saints, God's people. Here they're referred to as Ephraim and Manasseh, the sons of Joseph. Right. Um, So he's going to push the nations together to the ends of the earth, which is kind of a strange expression. Um, yeah, how, do, <clears throat> how does that work in the Hebrew? Well, that's what I'm looking at right here, right now. Yeah, so, so uh, this word, yakad, which means to make them one. Because uh, you have two different words, ikad and yokid. You know, uh, they both refer to, uh, to, to one, but one is a sort of a singular one. 
but this one is the unity. Um, so this is, so that's why it says unitedly, properly a unit, that is unitedly, alike, all at once, both likewise only together. So he's going to push the people, and, if, and, and this people here isn't the word like for nations like goyim. Uh, it's actually am, right, which is uh, people. And um, I'm just looking at this a bit more. Yeah, so uh, it's kind of interesting. They they have um, another Hebrew word attached to it that doesn't have a Strong's number. So I have really? to go, yeah. So I have to go look at what that is. Um, uh, Baham. Oh, I see what they're doing. Um, with with my people, with the peoples. Okay. So that's mean with. Here, I'm just going to look at, at another source here, because that's kind of odd. <laughs> Okay, so so it's a preposition. Uh, so with with the peoples of them, I guess is what it means. Um, that's interesting. Okay. So they're going to push uh, them together. So this, uh, literally, this is his unity. Um, or their unity. And and this is the, the entire earth. Or the end of the earth. It means the, the whole land. And then, of course, the ten thousands and uh, and then the thousands. Okay. Of Ephraim and Manasseh, so ten thousand of Ephraim and a thousands of Manasseh. I don't know it's pretty interesting. Okay. So him it's pushing. intriguing that that his glory is like the firstling of the bullock. Yeah, it's kind of a strange uh, imagery. And then for it to say, and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. Yeah, well, that, that one's weird too. Um, Because really what it says in Hebrew is his horns rise. So technically it says um, uh, her horns, referring to um, her horns rise, and rise is masculine, and then... Um, and then it has, uh, so it's just, yeah. So it has horns twice. If we if we were read this verse in context, 
Yeah. The prior verse, Deuteronomy 33, 16. And for the precious things of earth and fullness thereof, and for the goodwill of him that dwelt in the bush, let the blessings come upon the head of Joseph mm -hmm. and upon the top of the head of him that was separated from his brethren. Right. So this is the context. This is this blessing upon Joseph, the final blessing upon Joseph. The final blessing that Moses gives to mm -hmm. the children of Joseph, which would be Ephraim and Manasseh. Mm -hmm. Joseph's glory is like the first thing of, the, of his bullock. Yeah. And his horns are like the horns of unicorns. Okay. So it's interesting because the imagery here is not denoting something that we would see in the sanctuary because you didn't have a ram or a bullock with a singular horn being seen as being perfect. So why is Moses using the horns like the horns of unicorns? Yeah, and of course, it's not really unicorns. It's talking about a wild bull, but um, uh, let me see here. Yeah, so this word, so they translated unicorns, but see, I don't, I don't think this is translated that well. Um, because what it says, and, and, and the horns rise, the horns. Now they're taking that word that means to rise, they're translating it as unicorns. Okay. But it means to rise. Okay. Um, which is where you get a unicorn because it has one horn that rises up in the, you know. Um, but I don't know. It, it, to me, there's a doubling of these horns. I, I just don't know what this imagery means. Well, of course, as, as we look at this, if there is a doubling, we have yeah. a reference back to the second angel's message. Mm -hmm. At least that's the inference, right? Mm -hmm. Now, this, this verse with its preceding verse and its subsequent verse are also tied because Deuteronomy 33, 18, and of Zebulun, he said, rejoice Zebulun in thy going out and Issachar in thy tents. So we wind up again here with Zebulun being brought in right in line with Ephraim and Manasseh. But we have this doubling in 3317 that is also being combined with the 10,000s. Yes. Now, we also have Zebulun, as you noticed, um, which we have in Judges. We have Zebulun and Naphtali. Right. Now, here, um, right after the blessing of Ephraim and Manasseh, we have the blessing of Zebulun and Issachar. Right. And we also have this tense being mentioned, that Hebrew number 168. Right. And in Judges, uh, 
Now, Hebrew 168, is that Orhel? Or how uh, do you pronounce that? Yeah, where's this? Um, it's pronounced Ohel. Yeah. Ohel. Yeah, it's just, it's just a guttural sound there at the beginning. Can that also not be translated as tabernacle? Yeah. Or home or dwelling. Um, So. so this is about Heber, because that's really where we got to get back to. We got this uh, Zebulun and Naphtali, Naphtali to Kadesh. So we had that the holy ones attached to these with right. 10,000 men at his feet. And Deborah went up with him. Um, yeah, so... So if we try to bring this all together, the I mean, I still think Odilio's study brings it all together the best. Which which I know you didn't see it yet, did you, Dwight? Or no, I haven't. No. Uh, so I mean, his study is on the the signs and the sun and the moon and the stars, and. Um, So we have 10,000 um, here, which we, so one of the things we're addressing is these spans of time. So 10,000 men, we know that when we count the numbering of the people, that the numbers can, the number of the people can represent days. And, and we find that with both Zebulun and Naphtali. Okay. So, so, because Zebulun was used by Odilio in his study, the numbering of Zebulun, the 57,400. He counted back the days from July 18th uh, to, the, to the Sabbath of the General Conference when the church organized. So, so that connection of, of Zebulun from Numbers 2, verse 8, uh, we, I then applied Naphtali, and I counted that span of time as well. But I counted it from, to, it's, it's the span of time between the falling of the stars in uh, um, um, 1833 and uh, 1980. Not exactly to the day, but to the year. But I've also applied the 10,000 as days. Okay. So, I mean, we've already understood that this is talking about our time. So the way that we look at Judges chapter 4 is that this is referring to the history connected with um, uh, this movement and specifically, Specifically, it addresses uh, um, the apostasy in this movement. The enemy is being typified with Deborah uh, or with Sisera um, being uh, the message of Parminder, right? And so Deborah and Barak is that response message. So, I mean, I think we have enough to connect it all together. 
It's just we're going to have to take the time to do that. But I still think we need to move on and read the rest of Judges chapter 4. All right. So so I, I think we've exhausted, at least to this point, the 10,000. Well, let's, let's just finish reading the verses on this portion, and then we will return to Judges 4. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Now, the next symbol that we have is 1 Samuel 18, 7. Now, that's, that's pretty blatant for us. Mm -hmm. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Again, Aleph for thousands and Surababa for ten thousands. Right. 1 Samuel 18, 8. And Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him, and he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but the thousands. And what can be can he have more but the kingdom? 1 Samuel 21, 11. And the servants of Achish said unto him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing one to another of him in dances, saying, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands? This is repeated in 1 Samuel 29.5. Is not this David of whom they sang one to another in dances, saying, Saul slew his thousands and David his ten thousands? Why would this be repeated eight chapters later? Well, it's just, it's a different story, but... People refer to it. It's sort of proverbial regarding him. Right. But there's there's something else that's there as well. Now, Psalms 3, 6. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. We come down here to Psalm 144.13. So you have uh, a symbol of the 144,000 and a symbol of rebellion. Correct. That our garners may be full according all manner of store that our sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our streets. This is one of the last of the words that was being used in the Hebrew for this one is Hebrew 7231 Rabab cast together increase multiply by the myriad but when I looked at this Jeremiah 14 7 was one that was recommended and shown to be useful. So, O oh Lord, throw, though our iniquities testify against us, do thou it for thy name's sake. For our backslidings are many. We have sinned against thee. Yeah, so Rabab, many. Correct. So, we have these ten thousands and these many where they are cast together. They're multiplying by the myriad. They're multiplying without number. Then we have Daniel eleven twelve, And when he hath taken away the multitude, his heart shall be lifted up, and he shall cast down many ten thousands, but he shall not be strengthened by it. Here we have the third Hebrew word being used, but we're talking 
are we not about the king of the south in Daniel yeah. 11, 12? Yeah, so this is the Battle of Raphia. Okay. Could this also be applied with Parmender? Yes. So because it's this message of the Battle of Raphia that becomes, because uh, this is November 9th, 2019. Okay. In connection with Parminder. Because that's the date they predict. So is it is it saying here, when he hath taken away the multitude, <clears throat> we have certainly seen that happen. His heart shall be lifted up. Mm -hmm. I think that application is, is being revealed. And he shall cast down many ten thousands. But he shall not be strengthened by it. Mm -hmm. Now we have Micah 6, 7. <clears throat> Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my, my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Micah here uses the same verbiage as Moses did. Now, we're going to address briefly verses that came from the Apocrypha that had to do with 10,000s. Now, I've, I've had some recently that are telling me that I should not be studying from the Apocrypha and that this is a mistake. Yet, what does Mrs. White say about the apocrypha well she says some things about it obviously there are things about it that are not are not correct right you know. so does she not say that it is a hidden book and that the wise will understand yeah but it's not a pure book i can't remember the word she uses but it's 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 got problems with it. She uses I can't remember the word she uses. Well, then weigh this, and we we will weigh this carefully. Yeah. Daniel three verse seventeen, and I I footnote this because in this situation, in Cruden's. This is noted as verse 316, but it's noted as verse 317 in the 1769 Oxford Revised King James. Okay, now I'm having a hard time finding this verse in my Apocrypha because um, I don't have it there at all. So take a look at in, in the Apocrypha, it's under the Song of the children as they're cast into the fire. Yeah, so I, I just can't find it. I mean, I find the song, I just can't find this verse. Okay. So it must have another number. Well, just that, that starts at 324, the song of those in the fiery furnace. Give me just a moment, please. Oh, it's verse 40. Okay. Like okay. as the burnt offerings of rams and bullocks. Okay. 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 As the verse reads, like as in the burnt offerings of rams and bullocks, and like as in ten thousands of fat lambs, so let our sacrifice be in thy sight this day that we may wholly go after thee, for they shall not be confounded that put their trust in thee. Now this is 
this is the prayer of one of Daniel's friends after he has been cast into the fire, according to this in the Apocrypha. Mm -hmm. But we find that there were references here when I was looking this up that call back to different portions of the book of Psalms. The one that struck me the hardest, of course, was the reference to Psalms 5117. Because as this would show, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. And then we have Psalms 25, 2, 252, and 25, 3. O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. So Psalm 51, David's prayer, created in me a, a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit in me. But this is being referenced that the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, thou will not despise. That's quite the contrast with one that is lifted up and proud in spirit. And then for this also to give reference, showing that they shall not be confounded, but using Psalms 25 2 or 25 20. O oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Ecclesiasticus or Sirach. Verse 23, 19. Such a man only feareth the eyes of men and knoweth not that the eyes of the Lord are 10,000 times brighter than the sun, beholding all the ways of men and considering the most secret parts. Sirach 15, 19, and his eyes are open upon them that hear him, and he knoweth every work of man. The references that were then given include Psalm 33, 18, Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy. Along with Psalm 34, 15, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. Compared with Hebrews 4, 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Now the final verse. Sirach 47.6. So the people honored him with ten thousands and praised him in the blessings of the Lord in that he gave him a crown of glory. The cross reference from here took us right back to 1 Samuel 18, 7. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul hath slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. The first, the first word, that the one that Moses used, in dealing with this with 10,000s, 13 times of the 16 times, it deals with 10,000s. Three times, it deals with other words, other verbiage in different passages. And those three times are Genesis 24, 60, Numbers 10, 36, and Ezekiel 16, 7.
of the total that we're talking about, we have 45 different verses that deal with 10,000 or 10,000s. Excuse me, 54 verses, which would be numerically the reverse of 45. So there's quite a bit here. And now we will return to look at this in Judges 4. So in this portion that we addressed earlier, and Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh, and he went up with 10,000 men at his feet, and Deborah went up with him. This has been the impetus for us to look at this symbol of 10,000. The following verse, now Heber the Kenite, which was of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, had severed himself from the Kenites and pitched his tents unto the plain of Zarnam, which is by Kadesh. Yeah, and so we know that Hobab is the brother-in-law of Moses. Okay. According to the spirit of prophecy. Okay, do you have the reference on that? Um, grab it here. I'll find it here. Yeah, yeah it's um, Patriarchs and Prophets, 628, paragraph 2. Okay. She says, but while inflicting judgment, God remembered mercy. The Amalekites were to be destroyed, but the Kenites who dwelt among them were spared. This people, though not wholly free from idolatry, were worshipers of God and were friendly to Israel. Of this tribe was the brother-in-law of Moses, Hobab who had accompanied the Israelites in their travels through the wilderness, and by his knowledge of the country had rendered them valuable assistance. Okay. <clears throat> so we have Jethro being the father-in-law, Hobab being the brother-in-law. Mm -hmm. Now, does that mean in, in this way that Hobab was the brother to Moses' wife? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And they shewed Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, was gone up to Mount Tabor. So does that mean that the children of Hobab were the ones that showed Sisera the location of Barak? Is that the way we should look at this? I don't think it would be um, uh, them. I just, I just think it's an indefinite they. 
doesn't tell us who they are. Okay. So, you know, people would have seen um, where Heber went and where Barack went and so forth. But, you know, I can't say definitely, but it doesn't really make sense otherwise. Okay. <clears throat> And Sisera, gathered by proclamation all his chariots, even 900 chariots of iron, and all the people that were with him, from Herosheth of the Gentiles unto the river Kishon. What's the importance of 900 chariots? And that's that it is a large number. It's not as huge as 10,000, but it's a large number. Why is it important that we note 900 chariots? So we need to look at that. We also need to understand why he was gathering from Herosheth of the Gentiles unto the river Kishon. Okay, so... Um... So he's going to be on the other side. So where is he going? I'm just trying to look at this on a map. Well, if we look at this, while you're looking at the map, yeah. Aerosheth is from the workmanship of the Gentiles. Yeah, Hagoyim, the Gentiles. Aerosheth Hagoyim in Hebrew. Okay. So in other words, from the workmanship of the Gentiles to the place of ensnarement, Kishon. So is it possible that this was Sisera is showing us the the difficulty in accepting the workmanship of those that choose not to study according to Miller's rules Okay, I didn't quite catch the question. Um, so the idea is that he's gathering all this people from this area. Right. There's this huge area that he's gathering the people from. Um, so the Kaishan River flows into the Valley of Jezreel. And... So it's a it's a pretty large area where he's gathering all these people from to go fight against um, um, Iraq. So 
So what was your question specifically? Well, my question is this. I'm, I'm looking at these as symbols. Yeah. Is it possible that when we're dealing with this about Harasheth of the Gentiles, mm -hmm. the workmanship of the Gentiles, is this giving reference that he is a, that Sisera is assembling his army from those that would not study scripture according to Miller's, Miller's rules. rules. Yeah. yeah, and that makes sense. So, so he's gathering all these people and 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 under this false method of study. Right. Yeah. And when we're looking at the unto the river Kishon, river being people, but river of Kishon being the, the, the place of ensnarement. Yeah, so they're being ensnared. Now, it also means winding, um, and that's why it means ensnarement as well. Um, so... So I think, uh, I mean, that's definitely what Parminder did. Right. He, he, he ensnared them with this method of study, which we could look at as like a, um, a boa constrictor winding itself around uh, uh, the prey. But does Sisera represent Parminder along with some of these others that have chosen to reject this method of study and chosen to make use of what the other churches would use for their their interpretation rather than line upon line that they take they make use of the words of men rather than God well and the authority of man right so, I mean, when I look at the December uh, 6th declaration, right? I mean, it's a rejection of Miller's rules. I mean, just pure and simple. Um, because everything that we had come to understand in this movement regarding numbers was the result of Miller's rules. And to just say, well, we couldn't do that anymore. We couldn't use numbers symbolically in this way. That we couldn't compare the dates in 457 BC, for instance, with the dates in 1844, that that was just somehow, and they tried to say it was a deception of some sort, um, which made no sense. I mean, Satan doesn't have control over those types of things. Um, you know, I, I just found this, I mean, this describes specifically uh, Parminder's rejection of things, how he rejected things. It was basically just based upon an authority of man. We have decided that something isn't true or something is true, and, and you have to accept it. And if not, then you're cut off. Okay. Is there anything else that we can unpack from this verse? Any other symbols that we see? All right. And Deborah said unto Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thine hand. Is not the Lord gone out before thee? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor and 10,000 men after him. Um, okay, uh, just a thought. So, sorry. Sure. Um, now, the number of days from... Uh, August 29th, 2019 to December 6th, uh, 
2020 is 465 days. Okay. And when I look at these numbering of the tribes, Reuben has the number 46,500. So uh, 465 is one thousandth, I guess, or is that one hundredth? One hundredth of that number. So the 465 days, I mean, can we attach that then with the symbol of Reuben? Because Reuben, what's his symbol? What's his banner? Isn't he the ox? Or is that? No, he's not an ox. So it would be uh, here I have a list. Reuben is a man's head. Okay, man's head, all right. He's a man, but a man's head. It's a man's head, but the banner is also having the color of Sardis. Is that correct? Um, I don't know about that, but you could be right. But but the point is this number uh, 465. Right. 46,500. Uh, so one hundredth of that is 465. And that's the number of days between uh, this auspicious date. August 29th, 2019, and December 6th, 2020. So it would tie these two together as representing man or man's interpretation or understanding as opposed to God's. Now, it's interesting because when you look at, at 465, yeah. I look at two components. From 465, you have 360, which would be your prophetic year yeah along with 105 and 105 is a factor of the 2520 okay one of five is also the 10th day of the fifth month right And, and I believe that that represents uh, December 6, 2020, in a relationship with the, um, the 13 days after July 18th. Okay. Which is the 10th day of the fifth month. All right. So it's just a symbol of the rebellion after July 18th. Now, we have several other things to address in these verses. But we are coming to the close of our time together today. Mm -hmm. Are there any other thoughts, comments, or questions from what we have addressed today that you would like to bring forth? All right. Shall we then close with prayer? Um, okay. So uh, I'm not done. So I, I just want to just say a couple things here. Just okay. so so just to kind of tie what we've done. So we've gone through these symbols because we understand uh, the Judges chapter four is representing specifically uh, this history that we've had since Parminder's um, been presenting. Right. 
And 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 so we spent a lot of time dealing with these symbols, and and we're going to bring them together at some point. I mean, uh, you know, I can see how they're connected, but we can see that one of the things that's been given to us at this time uh, through Odilio was the numbering of the tribes of Israel. That these numbers are symbolic; they represent time, and in various ways, right? So we can see we take the forty-six thousand five hundred, and in this case, we're taking one hundredth of it. And applying it to the 465 days, where some of the other ones were taking longer periods of time. Um, so, so there are ways in which we can um, um, look look at these um, uh, look at these numbers. But we have to bring them all together into a structure that they make sense. Because we can't just take a symbol and just say, well, it applies to this without having a complete structure where everything fits. And so it's just going to take time to do that. So, you know, we sort of apologize to people following these studies because it is the most scattered I think we've been. Um, but that's because there's lots of rays of light coming to us at the present time that we have to gather up and set in order. That's logical. So do we do we work the rest of Judges chapter four and then begin trying to set this in, into place? What's your thoughts? Yeah, I think we should go through Judges chapter four. That's my view, is that we need to, to sort of complete it. Um, but I mean, it, it doesn't hurt like Friday night, because I'm, I'm definitely gonna have to address Odilio's study Friday night, uh, because I think it's important in the context of what we're studying because it does relate to 2030. Um, so, so I should be able to put some of that into place for people, but it's still gonna take us time going through the rest of Judges till we get it all put in place. So we just can, can start on it. All right. Anything else? Any other comment or thought? Okay. Shall we then close with prayer? Okay. Loving Father, we thank you for this time that we've spent together. There is much light that is being shown. We need your guidance in this light. We need your direction. And we need your blessing. Be with us each one today. Help us so that as we go forward, we may carefully consider these examples that we are being shown. Direct us where you would have us to be so that what is done today may be done to your glory. Thank you for these opportunities. Be with us now. For this, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.